Hello and good evening CTS 265 section 840 students for the fall 2015 semester at Anne Arundel Community College. This is the CCMP route course and this evening's video tutorial is going to be on the Cisco Networking Academy Lab 2-1. As you can see over here on my right we're going to be taking a look at EIGRP load balancing and just a couple quick notes here that um, this router here is actually uh, 12.4 code and it's actually this guy here router 3 in our setup who is the 15.3 so we've got a little mix and match <clears throat> excuse me of the different versions so let's go ahead and dive into this activity so you've got your background you're a senior network engineer considering EIGRP and your corporate network you want to take a look at equal cost and unequal cost load balancing I've already done all of the addressing configuration so we don't have to sit through that <clears throat> excuse me and so we can go ahead right now and uh, jump in on the step two of the lab and we're gonna go ahead and get EIGRP configured so we're on router one here so we're gonna go from user exec to privilege exec and into global config and we're gonna say router EIGRP 100 so we're gonna be using autonomous system mode or classic mode for our EIGRP configuration throughout this lab we do have a specific lab a Cisco learning labs activity where we're going to delve into named mode and so here I'm just simply going to say network 10.0.0.0 so what we're doing is we're actually enabling <clears throat> EIGRP on any interface in the 10.0.0.0 slash 8 subnet range and again since I'm not putting a subnet mask here this is going to interpret it EIGRP is going to interpret that entry to mean run EIGRP on any interfaces uh, that begin with 10 dot anything. So if I were to say do show um, IP EIGRP interfaces right now, you'll see that we have a number of EIGRP interfaces from serial 000, 010 and our loopback addresses, as you can see on the diagram there, everything is in the 10 dot X space. And so as soon as I enter that network command, we're gonna have EIGRP enabled on all of those interfaces. Uh, next we're going to step over to router 2 and we're going to do our classic mode configuration here to we're going to go from user exec to privilege exec and the global config say router EIGRP 100 and we're simply going to put the same network command in and actually before I do that if I were to say and just to show you if I were to say do show uh, IP EIGRP interfaces you can see right now we don't have any interfaces at all and once I enter the network 10.0.0.0 command in. Again, EIGRP interprets that as a classful entry. That's why I don't have a wildcard mask following that entry. Uh, it's just going to take it as classful. So now when we run that do show IP EIGRP interfaces command, you can see that we now have, uh, just like router one, we have a series of interfaces that are now running EIGRP. All right. So the next thing that we're asked to do in this lab is to kick off the debug IP routing and the debug IP EIGRP 100 commands because we want to watch as the routes get installed into the route, router 3 EIGRP database. So we'll go ahead and from user exec into privilege exec into global config and I'm going to go ahead and say do debug IP routing and we're going to say do debug IP EIGRP 100 to specifically debug the uh, EIGRP process or autonomous system number uh, 100. All right, so now that we've got that set up, let's go ahead and continue on. The next thing that we want to do is go in, well, actually, we're in global config. We're going to go ahead and turn on the router EIGRP. 100 to go ahead and set up the autonomous system number and again remember that this number that follows EIGRP the number that we have there and let me turn on uh, where's desk scribble there we go and let's shrink this down here so remember that the number that follows EIGRP here this is the autonomous system number the AS number and so remember that unlike OSPF where, and again, in the context of establishing neighbor adjacencies, um, the process ID with OSPF does not have to match. However, with EIGRP, this autonomous system number must match in order for an adjacency 
to be established between EIGRP neighbors. So let's go ahead and clear our screen there. All right, and so what we're going to do now is we're simply going to go ahead and enter the same net, whoops, the same network statement. Get back in this window here. Uh, network 10.0.0.0, and what this is going to do is this is going to enable EIGRP just like it did on the other routers. It's going to enable it on all of the same interfaces. Or I shouldn't say the same interfaces, but all of the interfaces uh, that have the same 10.x uh, network space. So that's pretty much every interface on the router. And we're also going to see some imp or some output here from our debug. We'll say do you all to kill the debug, and then let's scroll up and let's take a look at what the debug output is showing us. So we can see, and we're looking specifically for the route add entries and the update entry. So here you can see that we've got the routing table is adding 10.1.102.0 slash 29 uh, into the routing table. And you can see here it's giving us the EIGRP metric. And so again, we have the administrative distance and we also have the computed distance, or uh, you hear, see it referred to as the feasible distance. But this metric, um, when we get into the topology table, what you're going to see is uh, this metric can actually change. And we actually saw this in the Cisco Learning Labs video uh, that we did. I believe it was Discovery 4, where we saw uh, how that value can sometimes change, uh, but the feasible distance does not. And so here again, you know, we, we're adding another route, the 10.1.2.0, and that's via 10.1.2.0.3. And so we're on router three here. So what 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 it's saying is, um, so for the first entry here, this 10.1.102.29, that's this network right here, and you can see that it's adding it via 10.1.2.0.3.3. So it's coming in this interface here. And I think that was 2032. Yeah, 2032. Sorry, 101232. So we're learning about it coming in that interface because it's coming via this interface here. And again, it's just a series of adjustments or a series of ads for the routes. It's updating uh, the EIGRP uh, table, topology table. And so that's actually going to be the next thing that we take a look at. We're going to take a look at the rib, which is the routing table. We'll take a look at our neighbor statements here. So let me clear the screen, actually. All right. So we've got debugging turned off. If I say do show IP route, and again, remember, we're on router 3 here. You can see that router 3 is learning a series of EIGRP routes. And they begin on the left-hand side with the letter D. And that letter D stands for dual, or the diffusing update algorithm, the finite state machine that EIGRP uses uh, to calculate its uh, metrics. And again, we've got the administrative distance, and we have the metric, right? This is also referred to as the metric of the route. And we can see here that we actually have two equal cost paths. So equal cost, we can do equal cost multipathing using both of these routes, right? And so this would be considered the successor route, right? And it's via these two equal cost paths. And you can see that they've got the same administrative distance and they also have the exact same metric. And so if we're on router three and we're trying to go to 10.1.102.0, which is this network right here, we can go from router three, we can go this way, and we can equally go that way, and we're gonna experience the same cost or the same metric. And this is actually, we're kind of set up to have this um, be the value that values that we're seeing because this is how we're going to demonstrate uh, the equal cost multipathing and then we're going to take a look at unequal cost multipathing. So let's go ahead and clear our screen here. All right, so that's what the routing table looks like right now. Let's go ahead and take a look at the EIGRP neighbor table. So what we're going to do is we're going to say show or do show IP EIGRP neighbors. 
and you can see that we have a series of entries in the neighbor table and we'll go ahead and talk about these here so we have the order in which the neighbors were learned and typically you'll see the zero on the bottom representing the first adjacency to be established and then the one and if we had a third it would say two and show the address of the neighbor and then it shows us the interface now you can see here it's serial zero 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 so if I were to look over to ten uh, one two oh three two right so this is the dot two right here and you can see it's this is my interface so out this interface and so the way to read this is that this was the first adjacency established with this neighbor out my serial 000 interface and the whole time is 13 seconds and again this should be never dropping below 10 seconds because of the hello packets which are exchanged uh, every five seconds we've got our uptime so how long has this adjacency been established the smooth round trip time which is how long it takes uh, the update packets to or the any of the the EIGRP packets to uh, make a, a round trip f uh, to this neighbor and then back um, we also have the queue count the queues should always be or the queue count should always be zero if you see this number incrementing that means you've got an issue uh, somewhere with EIGRP and that it's unable to update the queue count the sequence number is simply just uh, the number of packets that we have uh, sent back and forth and so we get a sequence number count there so if I were to clear that and we were to say show IP EIGRP neighbors you can see that the uptime is continued to count uh, count up and the hold time uh, stays above 10 it should never drop below 10 all right so we've taken a look at the neighbor table now we're going to go ahead and take a look at the topology table and this is kind of really where we start to dig in and go deep dive so do show IP EIGRP topology whoops topology or just topo and it's in the topology table where we're asked um, what is the feasible distance of route 10.1.1.0 slash 30 in the R3 topology table. Well, if we take a look here down at the bottom, we can see that this is the successor route, right? And the feasible distance is 4064 followed by four zeros. Now, to be clear, this is not the feasible distance. This is the computed distance and it's actually nice to see um, that when you look at the lab they actually refer to this later on as the computed distance or just simply CD right so this is our feasible distance here and this is our computed distance so the answer is going to be that the feasible distance is 4064 now when we get to uh, question B, it, it talks about the most important thing is the two successor routes uh, are in the passive state. And that's what you want, is you want those routes in the passive state. If they're in the active state, that means that EIGRP is actively seeking a path to those routes. Um, now it's talking about the 101102, and where is that? Oh, very top here, nice. So the 101102 is what it's talking about, and what it shows is we have two equal cause paths. So because both of the routes have the same feasible distance, which is 4102-4000, they both get installed uh, into the topology table, and as you can see, uh, they both end up in uh, the topology table right here, and we saw them earlier uh, in the routing table because again um, they have the exact same metric so if I were to clear the screen here and let's make sure we're talking about those same routes to show IP route I believe those were the ones that we saw the 101102 yeah and there they are right there and you can see to get to that 101102 we have two equal cost paths two equal cost paths installed 
into the routing table. Now, this was a question that came up during the lab in class. It says, can you view the metrics before the composite metric is computed? And the word before in the question is a little misleading. So, because again, the composite metric is gonna be computed as soon as we uh, enable EIGRP um, on the interfaces that we are um, interested in turning EIGRP on. And I think we said that a better way to say that would be, um, can, you view the met can you view the composite metrics that are used in the calculation? And so the answer to that is yes. And that's where we're gonna go ahead and expand out our, our command here. So we would say do show IP EIGRP topo and we can actually use the 10.1.102.0 slash 29. And this is going to show us the routing descriptor blocks here. And so what it's asking is, can I see, because again, here you can see that it's an internal EIGRP route, because again, the AS number matches. And here's our composite metric, right? We have the computed distance, and we have the reported distance. So it shows us our vector metrics here, um, the minimum bandwidth along the path. So here is the first value that we're interested in, is the 64 kilobits, and then here's the total delay uh, along the path via 10.1.1031, which is out my serial interface 010, and I'm learning about this route from, or this path, from 10.1.1031. Again, reliability, load and remember that MTU is never used in the metric calculation in EIGRP um, gives us our hop count and then the originating router right this is always important because this tells us who is originating this advertisement so the originator is 10119 and we can see here that it just happens to be this loopback address on router number one and so uh, that's who we know who the originator is and again we see the 102032 uh, which is out our serial 000 interface but again here are the metrics here's my bandwidth and here's my delay and you'll notice that these values uh, both match right and so by default only bandwidth and delay are going to be used in the EIGRP metric calculation. So when these two values are the same, uh, then we're going to end up with the same composite metric, which we did here, 41024000. All right. Uh, so again, can you see it before it's calculated? Well, it's going to be calculated as soon as it sees the values, and so it's almost uh, impossible to see it before. But the question again, probably better phrased by saying, you know, can you, is there a way to see the metrics that were used uh, that resulted in the composite metric value, right? Or as we said here, we're talking about the computed distance. All right. Um, so let's go ahead now and take a look at equal cost load balancing. So let me go ahead and clear the screen here. And there's also some interesting stuff we'll see here when we do the trace route command uh, with what happens with trace route. So we're on router three still, and I'm gonna go ahead and type in. So now it wants us to type in the command trace 10.1.102.1. And so we know that that is the, the dot one interface for the 10.1.102 is router one's interface right here, which is dot one. So from router three, we're gonna send a ping, and the question is, is which way, I'm sorry, we're gonna trace route, which is gonna uh, use UDP. We're gonna trace route and see which way does it go. So I'll step back over here into our window, and we're gonna go ahead and hit enter. And so what's gonna happen here is that trace route is gonna send a UDP packet, and it's going to load balance those packets and by default, remember that Ceph uses per destination, right? So Cisco Express forwarding, which is the advanced Cisco um, internal switching mechanism in the router, 
uh, is going to do per destination load balancing with the UDP packet. So as you can see, the first packet goes out. Whoops, goes out the 101103. So that was packet number one. Then packet number two goes out the 112032. So packet number one went this way. Packet number two went this way. And then packet number three went back out this way. So what if I run this command again here? So we'll run it again and we'll see what we get. And we should pick up with the 10.1.203.2. Because that would have been the the next um, the next path in order. So there you go. Ten one. I'm sorry. Ten one two zero three two uh, is first, and then it'll go to one zero three dot one, and then it'll go to it should go to two zero three dot two. And now I'm going to run this immediately after this completes here. I'm going to see if I can recreate uh, the scenario that we had on Monday night. And this is actually pretty interesting. We're going to be talking about the um, ICMP rate limit, uh, which is by default uh, 500 milliseconds. And so I'm hoping that we can generate this quick enough. I'm not sure we're going to be able to generate this quick enough. And this is what I was referring to when I had said that uh, when I labbed it up, that this is the behavior that I saw come back um, where we did not end up with the asterisk uh, at the end of the the third packet which we were seeing here yeah and it doesn't look like we're gonna catch it so um, typically you may end up seeing an asterisk if you're running this extremely quick uh, which is you know you're tracing again and again and again super fast um, and that is because there is an a rate limit uh, basically a policer to protect the control plane and unfortunately it doesn't look like it's going to cooperate here and uh, give us the output that we're looking for. So let me go ahead, we'll just clear the screen. Oops, sorry about that. And close that down. Go ahead and clear the screen here. Yeah, it's not gonna cooperate with us because it seems like the pings are taking a little long uh, over some, some very slow serial <laughs> links here. So we'll go ahead and continue to drive on. But the key point here is that you can see that it is doing per destination load balancing right switching across each of the paths and there's actually a good note um, at the top of let's see what page page nine that talks about Ceph and uh, how Ceph does the rapid switching internally uh, you know using what we call the the fib or the forwarding information base and the adjacency table and in fact you can actually see those so if I were to say um, show I think it's show adjacency right you can see right there and there's a detail I believe yeah, there we go. Uh, show adjacency detail. And this is going to provide you uh, with a little additional information um, about uh, the adjacencies that you have out interfaces. You can see that these are point to point interfaces. And uh, there was a MAC address, I thought, that it would show you in some form the MAC address. And I thought it was in the detail output. Uh, let's do link show adjacency the link and see if that's it IPv4 yeah so it'll show you the adjacency but it's not giving you there's a there's an extended form I was hoping to get here and uh, that is not it all right so that you can see the adjacency there um, and if I were to say show IP Seth uh, this is the basically the fib and remember what the fib is right the forwarding information base is and this is what makes Ceph so valuable is that it is able to preload the the prefix right so if you're trying to go to 10114 which is where is the 10114 is that not on here 10114 10118 1012 and where's one of the routes here? Let me see. I'm looking for the 10111. Okay, we'll take this one here actually. So we'll let me pull that back. So we'll look at this guy here. So the the 10111.0/30, uh, which is the loop back here, right? If we take a look at this, you can see that 
Seth has already pre-calculated that the next hop for router 3 to get to the 10.1.1.0 slash 30, or 10.1.1.0 slash 30, is to go to 10.1.103.1, which is that interface right there. That's our dot one. And it already knows out which interface it's supposed to go. So it doesn't have to do a lookup because the lookup has already been done, right? And so this is what makes Ceph so effective. And again, remember that by default, Ceph performs per destination load balancing. All right, so let's clear the screen there. So we've got a chance to look at the adjacency table as well as the, uh, the fib. And so what it's asking us to do now, it's, it wants us to, uh, it says Ceph on R3 overrides per packet. Remember, we're doing per destination right now with Ceph on. And what they're asking us to do now is to do per packet load balancing. So in order to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to turn Ceph off. And very important note, you should never do this uh, in a production environment because this is have a very bad effect on um, the speed with which you're able to transfer uh, or switch the packets internally. So we're going to go, it wants us to go in interface serial 000, say no IP route cache, whoops, no IP route cache, and then we're going to go in interface, and for us it's going to be serial 010, and we're going to say no IP route cache. Oops. All right, so what this is doing is now we're going to, it's again, it's in, we're just basically trying to demonstrate how EIGRP uh, is going to load balance. And so this is going to force it to do per packet load balancing. And it says down here, it says another way to do this uh, is to type an IP load share per packet uh, on the outgoing interfaces. So we'll turn our debug back on. So we're going to do do debug IP packet. So we've got uh, debugging on. And then I'm just simply going to ping and you can see we've got some other information there. So ping 10.1.102.1. And we'll do a do ping here. All right, there we go. And then we're going to quickly get in our uh, do you all. All right, so let's slide back up here. Looks like I had some buffered output. So when we ran the ping, and we're looking for, where are we at here? Let's slide that up, 10.1. 2033. Yeah, so it shows us the source. So you can see here that when we did the debug, and where are we digging through here? Sending through right of Yeah, so you can see here that it shows the source, and that's actually no, that's our destination. Where here we go. Shows our source, right? 1012033. Well, 2033, that's us right here. This is the dot three. So this is the 10.1.2.0.3.3 here on router three, the serial 000 interface. You can see that that's the source, right? And then the destination was our ping and it went out serial 000. That packet went out serial 000. And then we had our 10.1, where are we at here? Make sure I get the right packet. Table ID, source. So the 10.1.102, so we should see 103. Yeah, here it is, the local. Again, so I'm looking, searching down for our locals. And here's the next one here. So it's the 10.1.1033, which is going to go out this way. So here's my dot three for that subnet. And again, the destination is the 10.1.102.1 going out serial 010. And so it's sending the full packet. So as you can see, this is the per packet, right? Not per destination, but per packet. And again, here's the next packet. And so we should see, I sent five. What do we have here? Sending full packet. And so if we match these up, one, two, three, four, and am I, let me, there's probably one just a skosh down here. So hold on, I'm gonna do this. Let's clear the screen here. And I'm going to scroll down and see if I can get all of these into one window. 
one, two, three, four, and five. Okay, there we go. So it looks like we have all five in the same window here. So you can see here's the first ping packet, right? Here's the second ping packet. And where are we at? The third ping packet, the fourth ping packet, and our fifth ping packet. And then you can see that it ends, right? And so these are the five ping packets we sent. So let's see, the first one goes to, actually we'll say source is 10 one. So this is the outgoing interface. Remember with ping, by default, if we don't put the source argument in there, it's the outgoing interface. So 10 one, two, oh, three, three. So the first packet went this way. The second packet went out the 10 one, one, oh, three, three. So number two went over here. Number three, right, went to the 101033, so that was number three. Number four went back to the 101033. And then finally, our fifth packet went back to 101033. So again, pretty effective way to demonstrate the per packet load balancing, which again, we had to disable Ceph and we had to disable route cache on those interfaces in order to get them to cooperate so that they would do this per packet load balancing. And can't stress this enough, don't disable Ceph in your production environment, whatever you do, right? But this is just to demonstrate that this is how you can see the per packet load balancing. Again, we see all five ping packets, two, three, four, and five. All right, so let's clear the screen there and let's come back down here. And I'm pretty sure it's gonna have us, uh, it actually doesn't have us turn Ceph back on, but we're gonna do that right now anyway. So let's say do show run zero, serial zero one zero. So I'm gonna say um, IP route cache. So we'll turn that back on interface serial zero zero zero. IP route cache and exit out and IP Ceph. All right, so we've got Ceph back on to show run include Ceph. All right, so we've got Ceph back on, we've got route cache turned off and uh, we already did our undebug. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take a look at some alternate EIGRP paths uh, that are not in the topology table. So let's go ahead on R3 and say show IP EIGRP topology again. And let's take a look at that topology table. Now remember, one of the key things here is that there are only two types of routes that will be installed, or I'm sorry, correction, there are only two types of routes that will be displayed when we type show IP EIGRP topology. And those two types of routes are successors and feasible successors, right? And you can certainly have more than one successor. You can see right here we have two. Remember, these guys, when the, uh, the dual finite state machine ran the algorithm to perform the calculation, the feasible distance for both of those routes was equal, right? And here's our computed distance. And here's the difference, right? And this is a key difference, uh, is that the feasible distance is a static value. This value here is dynamic and it can change. And we saw that, dynamic, I think I spelled that right. We saw that in the, uh, in the discovery activity that where we f did a little tweak with the delay and we saw that we're able to adjust this number here as long as we don't put this route, this successor route, into the active state. And so when is this static? So this has been static since the last time it went from active to passive. As soon as it goes from active to passive, this value is gonna be set and static. And that value will not change until it goes active to passive again, right? And that's why the computed distance is dynamic. This value can change in flight, right? And if it changes ever so slightly so that it 
doesn't put the uh, the successor route into the active state, these two numbers right here, the feasible distance and the computed distance, could be not equal to each other. Now they're equal to each other right now, and this is part of the reason it's so confusing uh, the difference between the computed different uh, computed uh, distance and the feasible distance. But again, if you keep your eyes on this on this number here, sometimes you'll see it change just slightly enough that it doesn't push the successor route into the active state, uh, and it, then it will be unequal. And again, if you look at that, I think it's the Discovery 4 video that uh, is posted, you can actually see that happen a couple of times. Uh, once we force it, and then the other time um, it happens on its own. Okay, so the question that we're being asked is, um, out of all the routes that were installed into the topology table, it says, why is there only one entry uh, shown in the topology table uh, there's two entries for the, what is it, the R1 and R2 loopback networks in the R3 topology table. Why is there only one entry shown in the topology table? And so let's take a look at the R1, uh, the 10111, 10.1.1.5, and where are we at here? They're down lower. So there's slash 30, so 10.1.1.0. So here's, this is on router, router 1 and the 10114 and this is going to be for router 1 and so the question is is why do these only have a single entry and the answer to this is that when the dual finite state machine called on the, com uh, the composite metrics to be calculated and the algorithm was run that took a look at bandwidth and latency and remember the bandwidth is the slowest bandwidth along the path and the latency is cumulative and they're both of those are on the outgoing interfaces right the outgoing interfaces so um, there's going to be additional delay involved going this way as opposed to going this way for these loopback interfaces. And so if I were to clear the screen there, if I were to say show IP EIGRP topology for 10.1.1.4 slash 30, let's take a look at our routing descriptor blocks here and let's see the values. And this command, right, this show IP EIGRP topology command and giving it the route that you're looking for this is a phenomenal command because instead of having to go router by router interface by interface you can run this command and see all right what was the slowest bandwidth along the path it was 64 kilobits and what was the cumulative delay along the path going towards 10.1.103.1 and as we see that, right, that's going this direction here because this is your dot one interface, this interface right here. So going this direction, the delay, cumulative, cumulative delay added up to 25,000 microseconds and the minimum bandwidth was 64 kilobits. Now when we take a look and say, well, what would it have run us, and sorry, I actually, was looking at that as three so going this way here cross that out there going this way here right it was the top uh, setup going this way the 10.1.2.0.3.2 route we had a 64 kilobit value as the lowest uh, bandwidth but then we had 45,000 microseconds right so you can clearly see that this is larger than this, those two values right there. And so this, in just sort of looking at it on its face, right, we can see that, okay, well, maybe this is one of the reasons why it's not in the topology table. However, let's remember that if we were to type, and let's clear the screen here. If I were to say, show IP EIGRP topology all links, and this is very, very important. When I say all links, I'm saying show me all links in the EIGRP topology table. And this is the one we were just focused on a second ago. And actually, I think it was, 
this one here. Same same uh, scenario though. It's going to be the same scenario, right? If we take a look here or take a look here, right? When we look at these two uh, routes or these two successor routes, 10114 slash 30, which represents that loop back on router one, and then 10110 slash 30, which also represents a loop back on router one. What do you notice as the difference when we use the all links keyword up here? Is that the topology table is going to show me every single possible route, right, to get to that successor route, right? So it's going to show me the different paths I can take, and it's going to show me all of them. And so here's the difference. If I don't use the all links option, EIGRP is only going to show me the successors and the feasible successors. When I use this all links option right here, I'm telling EIGRP, show me the topology table and show me the uncensored version of the topology table, the unabridged version. I want to see every possible path in the topology table irrespective of whether or not a route is a feasible successor or not. And so that's going to lead us into a conversation about the feasibility condition. So remember, this is the all links output here. And so prior to this, we only saw the best path, the successor for this successor route. However, now when we say all links, what do we see? We've got this new guy here and this new guy here. So if I take the reported distance, which is the second number after the slash and the parentheses here, that's my reported distance. If I take my reported distance and compare it to the feasible distance of the current successor, and that's the value of the feasible distance of the current successor, 406400000. And what is that? 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 40 million, 640,000. If I compare these two values, and it's interesting the way that, um, the way sometimes you'll see it referred to as strictly less than. But what we're saying here is if the reported distance of a candidate path is less than the current feasible distance of the current successor if and only if it is less than so we'll draw it out like this if the reported distance is less than the feasible distance of the current successor then you meet the feasibility condition and this is I really like the way that we kind of have this set up here is you'll notice I didn't say less than or equal to right we did not say that we said strictly less than so it has to be less it cannot be equal and you can see that right here right because these two values are equal so if the reported distance is not less than the feasible distance of the current successor, it will not be installed in the topology table as a feasible successor. So let's go back up here and let's take a look at the 101102 because we know that we're load balancing here. So let's take a look and see, does this meet the feasibility condition? Is the reported distance of this possible candidate here, is that reported distance less than the feasible distance of the current successor? If he is, he meets the feasibility condition and he will be installed in the topology table as a feasible successor, right? So here we go, one, two, three, comma, one, two, three, comma. So 40 million, 512,000, one, two, three, one, two, three. So is 40 million, 512,000 less than 
41 million 24,000 and the answer is yes and so we check that off he meets this candidate right here meets the feasibility condition which states that if his reported distance is less than the feasible distance of the current successor he will be installed as a feasible successor and in fact in this case he is actually a successor we have two successors because they have equal computed distances right so again kind of using this as an example here and I didn't actually check any of these other ones to see if any of them meet it doesn't look like any of them do so again this was just to sort of show that that meets the feasibility condition now if it meets the feasibility condition and they have the same computed distance they are going to be in it. it's again initially it would be the feasible distance they will both be installed as successors all right so this is extremely critical again if i were to clear the screen and come back and say uh, do show ip eigrp topology without the all links option do we see that second route here for the 10 110 30 we don't see we see it here whoops so we see it at the top, but we do not see it down here because I didn't say all, where's the all links? We didn't say that. And since this candidate guy right here or gal is not meeting the feasibility condition, it will not be installed as a feasible successor. Okay, so let's clear our screen here and let's go ahead and drive on. And so that's one of the key differences between the output of the show IPEI GRP topology and show IPEI GRP topology all links. So when you say all links, you're telling EIGRP, give me the topology, uh, the topology table in the unabridged format. Do not uh, hold anything back. Okay, so what is the reported distance to R or to the R1 loopback network uh, using R1 and R2 as next hop routers. Well, we can see uh, that the reported distance is the second number in the parentheses, and so that's going to be 1, 2, and we can pick any of these guys, 1, 2, 8, 2, 5, 6. That is our reported distance, right? And you can see that's a very popular reported distance because we've kind of uh, rigged our link speed, or rigged the... Um, kilobits per second we've kind of rigged the speeds here between uh, all of the links and we're kind of forcing this right but it's good because it's good to start out uh, start small an inductive approach and then uh, grow and become more complex with what we're looking at all right so we'll clear our screen here so that's the reported distance um, now it wants us to take again so we actually we already looked at the um, topology table for the specific route in question and it wants us to look at this 10.1. So if we were to say show IP EIGRP topo for 10.1.2.0 slash 30. And let me get that slash 30 in there. And 10.1.2. Sorry about that. There we go. And so it the question is, why is the route to 10.1.2.0 slash 30 through R1 not listed in the topology table? And again, just from looking at this we can actually do our own sort of calculation here so it's asking why is this route not in the topology table well I'm gonna take a quick look at the reported distance and I'm gonna compare that to the feasible distance of the current successor right and what do I see is this less than that and the answer is no they are equal and if they are equal, this guy will not uh, be in the in the topology table output when we don't use the all links option. So he's in the topology table, but in order to see him, we need to use the all links option on that show IPEI GRP topo uh, command. So remember, it must be strictly less than. And then the reported distance is the 4064000. Uh, 0, 0, 0. 
So it says, if the R2 serial interface were shut down, would EIGRP route through R1 to get to the 10.1.2.0 slash 30? Well, let's go ahead and do that. Let's jump on to router two here. We've been on router three for quite some time. So we'll get on to router two here. We'll go interface serial 010. And let me make sure I'm getting this. Would it route through R1? Oh, okay. Would it go through the 10.2 route through R1? Yeah. So if I go to interface uh, serial 010, and I got to make sure because my interfaces are a little different than the interfaces in the lab. So there are two interface, which they say is 010 is, give me a second here, their interface is showing, so router 2's serial 010 is actually, or 001, yeah, so the 001 interface is that interface that faces R3, so let's go ahead and we'll shut that interface down, that's our serial 010 interface, and they're asking, uh, would it route through R1 if the 001 interface is down? So we'll simply say shut, and then we'll take a look. So if I were to say now, uh, do show IP EIGRP topo for the 10.1.2.2.0 slash 30, what do we see? So you'll notice that we only have a single path right now and it doesn't show the dual entries again because the one was shut down so you can see that there's our minimum bandwidth and there is our delay in microseconds and so we have a single uh, successor and here is the feasible distance right so again still internal route and it's given us the feasible distance. So it says yes, right? So yes, we can clearly route there if I were to if I were to do a ping, say do ping 10.1.2. Uh, what is the IP there? 10.1.2.1. And I think we need to be, it wants us over on, sorry, it wants us on R3 here. Let me transition over to R3. So it wants to know, would R3 route through R1? Sorry about that. Thought I still thought I was on R3. So if I were to say, uh, show IP EIGRP topology for 10.1.2.0 slash 30. There we go. So it does show, and that I was looking at that, and I was like, that's not what I'm expecting to see. Um, and this is definitely not what I'm expecting to see from the perspective of R3. Because that interface, or did we shut the wrong interface down on R2? Do show IP interface brief. So we shut down the 10.1, and I shut the wrong interface down. I apologize. So let me bring that interface back up. I thought we were in. Aha. So 10.1. 203 is actually serial 000 on our router. So let's shut that down. And the reason I realized that that wasn't happening was you can see here that this is telling us the successor is 101232, which was the interface I had thought we shut down. All right, so we're, we've straightened things out here. So we're going to run that command again. And you can see now the question is will it route through R1? Absolutely, it's going to route through R1, but if I say show IP EIGRP topo and we take a look at that 10120, you can see that we only have a single successor, right? And it has an absolutely uh, terrible metric, which we saw before. And remember, this didn't get installed before because it was equal to the feasible distance of the current successor. However, now that we've shut the interface down between router two and router three, uh, we actually, this route does get installed. So the route had to go into the active state, right? Or I should say the successor route had to go active 
right, to find and guarantee that this was a loop-free path. And this is how the loop freedom is being guaranteed. All right, so now it's asking us to run a ping. And let's go ahead and kick that off. So if I say ping 10.1.2, oh, sorry, 102, 102.1, and we're gonna repeat it a whole bunch of times here. All right, so there goes the ping. So it says, enter the interface configuration mode on R1, and it wants us to shut down the link uh, between two and three. However, uh, it we probably want to go ahead and if I'm not mistaken, we're probably going to want to bring that link up. Let's bring that link back up because I don't want to leave that link down. So we're going to say no shut. And let's see what happens here. So we bring the link back up and you can see the pings just keep cruising right our adjacencies back up adjacencies up over here so now what we're going to do is we're going to manipulate uh, router one and so it's asking us to get onto router one we're going to shut the interface down between one and three let me make sure i've got the right interfaces here do show ip interface brief and again i apologize my my routers are a little different than the uh routers that they're showing in the demonstration there so my interfaces are a little different. So this is serial 010 for us. So that is correct. So interface serial 010. Because this is the path that we're currently using. So I'm going to go ahead and say shut. And it's going to shut the interface down. And we're going to see... How many pings we lose there. So one second, two second, three seconds and then we're back right so it looked like about a three second delay and then we were back so how many packets were dropped well it may vary so we we had four packets dropped but again your mileage may vary so we deactivated that serial link um, let me go ahead and we're gonna do a no shut we're gonna bring that link back up and let's see if that affects anything does anything stop or does it just continue to cruise? And we said, do show IP interface brief. Whoops. Do show IP. There we go. Okay. Just taking it a second there to come back up and then the adjacencies back up. And you can see that we've got no break in the flow. All right. So we'll do control shift six and 99%. So not too bad. So we dropped four packets, so not too bad. All right, so the next thing we're gonna take a look at is unequal cost load balancing. And so what it's asking us to do is to change uh, the bandwidth between routers R1 and R2 and R1 and R3. So let's go ahead and let's jump on to do show IP interface brief. And it should be 102, so this is going to be interface serial 000. We're going to say bandwidth 128. Uh, we're going to do the same thing over on router 2. Do show IP interface brief. And this is going to be interface serial 010. We're going to say bandwidth 128. And we're going to do the same thing between, actually come back over here to router 1, interface serial 010, and bandwidth 128. And then finally on router three, we're gonna go into global config interface is serial 010, and we're gonna make that bandwidth 128. So 128 kilobits a second. And so basically what we've done, I'm gonna come over here, I'm gonna adjust the drawing here, right? So that's the only one now that's at 64 kilobits a second. So this guy here is 128, and our bandwidth on these links here is also 128. So now we're going to go ahead, we're going to run that show IP EIGRP topology command again on router 3, but this time we're going to do it, uh, we're going to see something different. So if I say show IP EIGRP topo for 10.1, 10.1.2.0, make sure that's the right one, yep, slash 30. And so now what do we see? So the 10.1.2, whereas before, we saw uh, this, I'm sorry, which way are we going here? 10.1.2.0.3. Yeah, so whereas before we saw 
a different value here you can see now that the value has changed right so we put a bandwidth in here of 128 and so this is going over to from router 3 over to router 1 this is clearly changed right and you can see that we've got our delay is still at 45,000 microseconds but the bandwidth is 128 kilobits and then here what do we see we've got 64 kilobits still going up this way right so when we take a look at these numbers here what do you think here's the reported distance and here is the successors feasible distance so who is our successor right now it's this guy right here right and we can tell that real quickly by looking at the computed distance is is the same so that tells us it's the successor so we see that this is the successor route so the question is would this be a feasible successor if I look here the question is is the reported distance less than not less than or equal to less than the feasible distance of the current successor if they are that meets the feasibility condition and this guy will be installed into the topology table as a feasible successor all right and so just looking at those numbers we've got what 128,000 here and here we've got a much larger number than 121 million so no question this guy this candidate meets the feasibility condition right so let's check that out if that's a true statement when we go ahead and type in here uh, show IP EIGRP topo for the 1012 what should we see and here it is right here we see we're passive and we did not use the all links right I did not use all links and here he is right here so there's a single successor here is our successor for this successor route that is our successor is 10.1.1.0.3.1 um, because again uh, his composite metric is better or computed distance sorry which is the metric right now is better than that guy however this guy right here this feasible successor met the feasibility condition so he is installed into the to the topology table um, as a feasible successor so we made the changes uh, in the bandwidth and now let's go ahead and see who gets added to the routing table what do you think well remember the feasible successor is not added to the routing table the only route added to the routing table will be the successor right so there we go and where is our entry for 10.1 this guy right here via the successor 10.1.103 and you can tell from our values here our administrative distance and the composite metric excuse me composite metric that it was the first route that was our successor right okay let's go ahead and move on so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and use the variance command uh, yeah the, the variance command and that's gonna allow us to do unequal cost load balancing so again uh, this is something that is use case specific in terms of when you would want to do unequal cost load balancing or not and excuse me in one second I'm gonna sneeze I think <coughs> excuse me <clears throat> excuse me so it's use case specific is when you would want to use it and again um, if you have multiple paths and you don't want those paths to sit idly by uh, this is one of the really uh, convenient features of EIGRP uh, that you cannot do with OSPF there's no way to do unequal cost load balancing like you can here in EIGRP so there's two criteria that need to be met in order for a route to be used in unequal cost load balancing and the first is it's got to be loop free okay and so 
what are the only routes that are loop free in the EIGRP topology table? What do we call uh, those routes, the routes that aren't the successor, but yet they can provide uh, loop freedom, right? And if they meet the feasibility condition, they would be feasible successor. So it's got to be a current feasible successor in the topology table. And the metric has to be lower than, um, and let me make sure I get it. So the metric of the route must be lower than the metric of the best route. So the successor multiplied by the variance configured on the router. So let's, and that's, you know, sort of the scientific explanation there. So let's go ahead and jump into the topology table real quick with the show IP and let's walk through the show IP EIGRP topo. And we are interested in the 10120. So this is the one that we're going to be continuing to work with here. Right? We're looking at this guy right here. So again, the first rule, it's got to be it's got to have loop freedom if we're going to use the path for unequal cost load balancing. Now we know that this guarantees loop freedom because if my reported distance, and when I say my, we're talking, I'm talking about this feasible successor here, if my reported distance is less than your feasible distance, I can guarantee loop freedom because what I'm saying is, is that this path through me, I am closer to the destination than you are. And when I say you, I'm saying, hey, this successor right here, I am closer to the destination than you are because my reported distance is less than your feasible distance. And the reason that that guarantees loop freedom is that if my reported distance is lower there is no way I can be going through you because, again, your reported distance is even higher, right? So when, the re when my reported distance is less than your feasible distance, then I can't possibly be going through you to get to the destination. And so that's how the loop freedom is guaranteed in EIGRP. And so we're going to be working with these uh, two routes right here. So we're going to go ahead and turn on, and actually, we'll talk about variance real quick. So the second criteria, so that's the first criteria, is it's got to be, the route has to be able to, to be loop free, and it must be a current feasible successor in the topology table. And so this route right here checks that box. The next one is that the metric of the route must be lower than the metric of the best route, the successor, multiplied by the very... And so what they're saying is it's got to be lower than the metric of the best route multiplied by the variance configured on the router. So that is the metric of the best route, which is... What do we have here? One, two, three... And then one, two, three. So we have 21 million, 152,000, one, two, three. And so when we go to set the variance, right? And let me make sure, yeah, we're on router three. When we go to set the variance, if we set the variance to two, what that says is it's two times the feasible distance. And it's the feasible distance of what? It's the feasible distance for each route in the routing table. So if we're using the example that we have, if I multiply this number right here, well, actually, I've already written it out over here. So it's two times, and I should say the feasible distance is here. Let me correct that. So that's the, they happen to be the same right now. And in fact, let me clear this real quick. We'll start from clean scratch. So that number, the feasible distance of the current successor, so 2, 1, comma, 1, 5, 2, comma, 1, 2, 3, multiplied by the variance, and this is where we're going to, V-A-N-C-E, and this is where we're going to uh, come into the configuration component here, is we're going to say that we're going to multiply it by 2. So we're going to say that number times 2. So the variance 
would be 2. And what does that equal? 42, and that's going to be 304. Yeah, 304, 1, 2, 3. So yeah, so 42 million 304,000. And that is what we end up with when we add the variance to command, right? So again, we take the feasible distance of the current successor, we multiply that by our variance, right? And again, the feasible distance of the feasible successor, I'm sorry, the feasible distance of the current successor is 21,152,000. And so we multiply that by the variance, that gives me 42,304,000. So what is the feasible distance of the, or I'm sorry, what is the feasible, and let me try to say this right. So the feasible distance of the feasible successor, which is that number right there. And again, that's the feasible distance of the feasible successor is equal to one, two, three, one, two, three. So it's equal to 40 million six hundred and forty thousand one two three and so the feasible successor can become another path so it can be added into the routing table that we so we can do equal cost or I should say unequal cost load balancing across this additional path because he was a feasible successor, right? So this guy was a feasible successor. Let me get rid of that. We multiplied the feasible distance of the current successor by the variance value. Its default is one, we changed it to two. So what we're saying is any feasible successor in the topology table who has a feasible distance less than the product of the variance var variance value times the current successor's feasible distance. Any feasible successor who meets that, the, that condition right there will become an, another path in the rib and we will be able to do unequal cost unequal cost multipathing, right? So unequal cost multipathing, we'll do that, or you could say load balancing, right? So because again, it is less than the feasible distance of the current feasible successor is less than the new product of the current successor's feasible distance times multiplied by the variance value that we add. So if I were to say variance three, it would make this close to 63 million and he would still meet the criteria. And then maybe other routes may fall in there if we have other feasible successors who have a feasible distance that is less than 63 million, then that would work as well. However, with two, it's going to work. So let's go ahead and let's make that change. And so on router three, it's a very easy change. We go into global config, we say router EIGRP, whoops, EIGRP 100. And I simply add in variance two. And so again, this is locally significant that I'm saying on router three that any routes in the routing table or in the topology table, I should say, any EIGRP routes in the topology table who have a feasible successor who after I apply that command right there variance two, who any feasible successors that have a feasible distance less than the current successors feasible distance times the variance variable of two they are now going to be installed into the routing table and we are going to be doing, and we are going to be able to do um, e unequal cost multipathing. And in fact, I was so wrapped up in my explanation there. Let me, um, we did not debug here, so we'll say no variance to, and it wants us to do the uh, do debug IP EIGRP 
100. Let's add the variance back in. And we should see that it's going to get installed into the route. And there you can see the routes are being installed in the routing table. We'll say, do you all? So let's take a look here at the debug output. And I love the debug output. You get some fantastic, uh, phenomenal information here. And so where is the route we're interested in, which was that 10, 1, 2, 0. Ah, there we go, right here. So again, there were some other ones that met the criteria, but we're kind of working with this guy here. Route installed for 10, 1, 2, 0, right? And it shows the administrative distance and it gives us the computed distance. So if that's the case, right, if it says it installed it into the rib, let's take a look and see, are we doing unequal cost load balancing now? If I say do show IP route, whoops, do show IP route, and the 10120, absolutely, we now have two successors. And remember, it's only the successors that get added in because when we made that change with the variance, we tweaked it just enough so that feasible successor is now considered to be a successor and he is installed in the routing table as you can see here and that was the path I believe it was the path here yeah because that was yeah that's right because this was the um, feasible distance of the feasible successor at the time because typically for this to happen these need to be equal these two computed distances need to be equal and they're not. And so this tells us, right, just this, this output right here, you can see that we are doing unequal cost load balancing. And it was all as a result of that variance command that we added in. All right, so now let's go ahead, let's see. If I say do show IP EIGRP topo, right, if, I'm, if that's correct, we should see that there are two entries there, and yes, they are both in there, and it shows absolutely that we now have two successors, whereas before we only had a single successor. So now here's, and this is also one of the trickier things with uh, EIGRP. So now that we're doing unequal cost load balancing, we need to take into consideration um, how, what the ratio is going to be, right? So let's go ahead and to see that we're going to say do show IP or actually we're going to say uh, do show IP route for the 10.1.2.0 slash 30. And did I not get that right? 10.1, oh sorry, 10.1.2.0, right? And so this is going to show me, again, the descriptor blocks. The key thing to remember is this asterisk here that we see. That means that that is going to be the path uh, used uh, next, is going to be the 101103. The key thing to catch here is the traffic share count, because this shows you the ratio of how that load balancing is going to be done. Because remember, it's unequal cost paths. So when we talk, when it's equal cost paths, and the desk scribble died on me there, when it's equal cost paths, right it's one for one when they're equal when they're unequal what is the traffic share count right and here's the traffic share count and so that's what we're interested in so it's 48 the ratio is for every or so 48 packets will go over serial 010 for every 25 packets that go over serial 000 and so this is pretty close to, what would that be, 50 to 25? So this is pretty close to two to one, right? So for every two packets that use serial 010, one packet will go across serial 000. And again, this is very important, right? We get that out of that do show IP route for the specific prefix and it's going to give us the traffic share count. All right. Um, let's see what else we've got left here. 
and I think that is it. And so uh, let's go ahead and confirm that we can see the variants do show IP protocols, which I'm not sure we've run yet uh, through this session. And you can clearly see here uh, that the variance for EIGRP100 is set to 2. Now, so that concludes the lab, but here's, I'm going to leave you with a thought, right? And actually, when I was labbing this up, I'm going to pull the variance out. Um, let's see where we put that in. I'm going to pull the variance out. So here's something to think about. And we kind of talked about this on in, on, in class on Monday. So if I were to go back into uh, do show IP interface brief, if I were to go into the serial interface here between router 1 and 3, so interface serial 010, and say no bandwidth 128, so let's, and actually, yeah, we'll set that back, uh, we'll say bandwidth 64, actually. So we'll say bandwidth 64. If I were to change my end cap here to PPP, and let's do that on interface serial 000 as well. End cap PPP, show run int, let me make sure it's 64. Okay, it is. Let's go to router 2 and let's do the same thing on router 2's interfaces. So we're going to say no, or we'll just say bandwidth 64. And we're going to say in cap PPP. And then uh, we're going to go to interface serial 000. And we're going to say um, in cap PPP and then bandwidth 64. And then let's go over to router 1 and do the same thing. So we're going to say bandwidth 64 and in cap PPP and then we need to get into do show run interface serial 000 yeah so interface serial 000 in cap PPP and the bandwidth at 64 alright so now we've set everything back to the original settings however did you catch what I did there I set the in cap to PPP Right, so we're using point-to-point -point protocol encapsulation across the serial links. We're no longer using Cisco's HDLC. So here's something to think about. If I say show IP route, do we still see the same thing that we saw before? We do. If I say show IP EIGRP topo, we still see the same thing we saw before. If I say trace to 10.1. Uh, where were we going there? 102.2 is, I believe, what we were originally tracing to. When we were checking on the load balancing using the trace route utility, we're going to go ahead and check and see here what the behavior is. And actually, we're going to 102.1. So let me let me change that to 102.1. So from router 3 you can see I go to 103.1 and then I go to, let's change that to 10.1.102.1. And remember before we were load balancing. So I was going to 10.1.103.1 and then 10.1.203.2. So there you can see I go to the 10.1.203.2 and we've got the right address in here. And let's see if we're still load balancing. And then the next uh, packet goes to the 10.1.102.1. However, that looks much different than what we originally had when we were not doing PPP encapsulation, let me see if we can get back up here. We had the pings, and I have the trace routes up here. And so again, this was interesting to see, and I apologize, we're trying to dig back up to the trace routes here. There were the routing updates. We had the debugging, so it was after the debugging where we should have been doing the trace. And here we go, right? So take a look. This is the output we had before where it showed it going to 1031, 2032, 1031, and it did that repeatedly for us, right? However, 
Look at the output now. All three packets go this direction, and then all three packets go to the 101022. So it's not going to the 112032. And so my question to you, at least it didn't there, actually it did here, and then it went to the 101021. So my question is, why with PPP encapsulation is it no longer load balancing? Because again, show IP route, should it not be load balancing? It was before. We changed the encapsulation to PPP and now it's not. So what is it and why, when I change the encapsulation from the Cisco default HDLC to PPP, why did that change the behavior? So think about that and let's chat about that on this coming Monday. All right, so this wraps up lab activity. This is really your solution set for lab activity 2-1 from chapter two EIGRP load balancing. We took a look at the variance command, equal cost uh, load balancing, unequal cost load balancing. Um, and this was a fantastic lab. All right. Thanks for watching and I will see you guys this coming Monday.